Now, on this record, and actually both your records, you had Leonard Doc Gibbs doing the percussion, and he was on the show. Uh, great guy. I really enjoyed him. Um, what what did he add? He added some sort of flavor to what you guys were doing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, John Dutch Braddock is our percussionist, the band's percussionist. Um, and so Doc came in to add some, some extra flavor, him and, and uh, uh, John together. But what Doc brought in was um, Doc is a master of sounds of because of, of, he's, he's got all those little instruments, man, that he knows exactly how, what to break out to fill a, a space uh, that is just right. And his timing is just so great. I, I think out of Doc um, performing with us, the one that sticks out the most for me is from the second album, Say You Love Me, Girl. And he came in with the with the uh, uh, timbales, and that the timbales that Doc put down, I think actually it made the song. When when he laid those timbales down, it just the song just said, "Whoa!" Yeah. And, and you know you can hear those bells and those temps, and yeah, it just it, amazing. He's an amazing studio musician, Doc, and you know I love him. But we've been we've been playing together for years. He's moved out to California now. Um, <laughs> Baba Doc, he calls himself. Now, do you take that? Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that track, and that would bring us to the second album. The, the percussion on that track was great. I love the way it worked with the, uh, the, the rhythm guitar part. And um, to me, it was almost like an Earth, Wind, and Fire kind of thing, but really cool. Yeah, yeah. So that second record, guys, um, in 1980, Splashdown. A lot of folks consider this an all-time funk classic, um, and I can't argue with them that uh, Splashdown Time, uh, Release the Beast, You, uh, just great funk tracks, and Let Love In is a really cool, brassy R&B kind of thing. Um, tell me about the making of this record. Uh, what are you proud about in terms of this record? And did you have more freedom? What was it like? Go ahead, Fred. Well, it was, I mean, we were, at this point, we were sort of, uh, we were kind of refining our sound. We kind of, you know, we, you know, we, we had some markers from the first album that we knew kind of worked for us. And, um, you know, the, uh, so in some senses, um, we had a better sense of what songs were going to work and, 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 uh, and what we, you know, and kind of, yeah, you know, we're just better at it by this time. Um, I, I had more of a clear idea of what I wanted to do with the horns. Um, and, uh, we, we, we got back to the original instrumentation of that. I, that I used on the horns on the, uh, uh on all the demos, which was, uh, we simply, it, our, the horn section we started with was uh, Gene, who's the lead singer um, and just sings lead now. When I first joined, played trumpet and sang lead. And then uh, uh, Vince Dutton was the other saxophone player. And we basically uh, played with three horns. And when we did the demos, you know, I'm, I'm the big band guy. I always want more brass. So we added, when we did the, uh, the demos, we added another... Uh, trumpet player uh, and, uh, and a trombone player. Uh, Robin Eubanks played on the demos, by the way. Um, Robin, he played on the demos as well. He played, he played on the- Yeah, he played on some of the first album. Yeah. He didn't play on the Brand, second Brand. album. He didn't play on the second album because he uh, yes. did the second album on the West Coast. Right. And um, we used the, uh, we used the guys from Sea Wind. So we, we, we basically expanded the horn section to the, the 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 two trumpets, trombone and and saxes. I played Barry on the on the horns, and we did those those sessions, all the horns in in two sessions on the west coast, um, on a Saturday, uh, in Santa Barbara, um, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, we uh, uh, it was those those guys were very very good. Uh, they came, you know, and uh, Jerry Hay came in and said, you want me to take this part up an octave? I said, really? I said, sure. 
So Jerry Hay took him up, all this stuff up an octave, and I said, "Go, Jerry." Uh, so that stuff on uh, that stuff on uh, on uh, on uh, "Let Love In" and uh, um, uh, "You" and uh, this all screaming is all Jerry Hay going, "Hey, you want me to take this up an octave?" And me going, "Sure." <laughs> yeah, but, uh, it works. Guys, no, no, no. And there's they they were super pocket players. And, uh, you know, Vince and I played, uh, Gene's just sat out for that one. He was like, he was focusing more on the, on the lead singing at that point. Uh, he was still playing trumpet with his live, but for the session, uh, uh, they was, those, you know, those guys were a section already. So they just, they just, you know, just plugged it in and the, whole, the stuff went like that. It was like, we, we, we threw it down and it was there, it sounded gorgeous. And, uh, and that was the horns. It was like all done in two days. All those horn parts on the second album were done in two days. The, the let, let love let love in horns um, reminded me almost of something like the horns from uh, "Got to Get You Into My Life" by Earth Wind the Fire. I mean, it's real punchy and brassy. Sure, absolutely. There's that, and then there's and again, you can hear a lot of my big band roots on that. I mean, uh, I had a lot of fun with that one. Um, uh, that is like there's some stuff that would totally work right out of you know uh out of any big band on that on that stuff um I, and yeah. yeah i mean and got to get you into my life is like that's you go back and that is gotta go you know that stuff comes earth wind and fire those horns are derived from big band horns more than uh i i did some arranging for philly international but my style was much more hard driving uh than 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 philly international they wanted that orchestral horn sound and i was all about the you know the screaming punching you know horns um so i didn't do a whole lot of work for philly international not because i couldn't it was just like it wasn't my style but uh i did a couple of songs i did uh, uh i did the horns for what's your name so um, um for dexter for, oh, so sorry. Phil Simon, yeah, I did the horns for Phil Simon. Well, yeah, we had we had a ball, man, recording um, that second album because we all we all went out to Santa Barbara. We were out there, I guess, almost two months. Ago. Yeah, we were out there. Yeah, not a bad place yeah. to hang out. No, yeah, no, it was a great, beautiful place. And Santa had Barbara a, had such. We had a motel on the beach. Wow. Right on the, yeah. Santa Barbara had such a great musical community too, and that that was that was was a ball. Um, like uh, Ayerto and Flor Perrine and um, Joe Cocker. We used to go to these jam sessions, man. It was it was it's a great place to make a record, man. <laughs> really, really, really good studio. Yeah, it was a good studio. We we, we, we had a ball. I think, I think the fun that we were having. Um, came out on the on the record you know the joy and the, and the uh, being away from home being together and recording like that in this beautiful place right on the beach it, i think it came out of the record you know with splash down time and say you love me girl just that feeling is a you know is a, a, a great freedom you know because that one thing i remember clearly is that when we came home from from the uh doing the uh the album we flew into New York and it was freezing, <laughs> and we kind of like drove through, you know, I guess uh, I don't know Brooklyn or whatever, and it just, just you know, it was it's kind of like a culture shock again coming back to the East Coast after being out there, you know, for for um, you know for me the first time as an adult, even though I was born or you hadn't been there since I was a kid, you know, but it's like you know. It gave us kind of like a, a looseness that I think came came across on the record. You know, on this record, I felt like there were more influences that were identifiable in terms of sort of the um, sign of the times being, you know, some like Earth, Wind & Fire flavor, some maybe Confunction flavor, some kind of like that going on. I mean, I felt like you guys definitely had your ears open to what was happening at that time. Well, I, I, I'm not sure if we had our ears open to in terms of uh, emulating what was happening around us consciously, you know. Um, I think we were really concentrating on creating original music 
that was what who who we were. Um, now our influences all come from the same from the same pool. You know, Confunction, Sun, Cameo, all of the groups that were were, were out at that time. We all listened to the same you know, uh, uh, pool. Earth, Wind, Fire was was really one of the first that you know bands that. You know African American uh, bands like that 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 uh, that took off, but you know we would listen to like you know of course Roy Ayers and and uh, um, Chicago, but I think we were really concentrating on working on our own sound, um, which was the same thing that the other bands were doing. So you know there was an Ohio sound as well. You know the Confunction. Ohio players. There was a couple other groups that came out of Sun that came out of Ohio that had a, had had a sound. Um, All right, Heat Wave. Um, Heat Wave. Yep, exactly. Yes. So um, I don't think we were consciously trying to, um, you know, put together a hodgepodge of what was around us. I think we were more, really, more looking inside to see what was in within us to to uh to put out and to um you know to create kind of a you know something new like for instance um the song uh, uh release the beast for us that was something we had never really done anything like that and that was kind of us like really like going on the edge to try to push that that rock funk groove thing um, cause live, man, we would just tear, we would bring the house down with that song when we played it, you know, like before we recorded it. Um, and, uh, it's, it's amazing that the, um, the endurance that that song has had, because like that song was recorded in 1981. And like, as we talked about earlier, it's got the band broke up for 29, 30 years and, I started hearing Breakwater on like a, a Super Bowl halftime or, or like during the breaks during the Super Bowl and on um, Dancing with the Stars and all of these different places. I'm hearing, wait a minute, that's Breakwater. Well, what had happened was a group called Daft Punk had sampled Release the Beast and had a huge international hit. They didn't just sample a piece of the song. They took a chunk of the song and then they put like these robot voices on top of it. They had this song called Robot Rock, which was a huge international hit. And what I was hearing was actually Robot Rock. Um, and that song got a, had a lot of traction. And at that point, the band was still, you know, we hadn't gotten back together at that point. And most of the guys in the band hadn't even really thought about Breakwater, except for the fact that our fans here in Philadelphia would, on a daily basis, and I'm, and I'm not exaggerating, I mean, at least five times a week, at least, someone would ask me, what happened to Breakwater? When do you guys get back together? Man? For 29 years, you know what I'm saying? So, but but the song release of Beast, it actually has, had traction, and the way that Daft Punk, when they released it, they released it, it says, you know, Daft Punk as performed by Breakwater. So what we're finding now is that as we are back together and when you look on the internet and if you Google Robot Rock, you see that there are all of these folks that have, that know who Breakwater is because of Robot Rock and know that Daft Punk sample break, sample Breakwater. And so like, they're really like looking to see who the band is and, and you know, uh, at the gigs that we're doing now, you know, because most of our, our fans that were out when our records came out are like, you know, in their late 50s, you know, early 60s. So when we play our fan base, you know, that's what we see, you know. But now we also see these young people who are coming in the band, come in to see the band, you know, of all races. And they're like singing the songs as we're playing. I'm looking at their lips and they're like, they're into, they know what they're, what they're listening to. And so I, I have to attribute that, a piece of that anyway, 
to release the beast and Daft Punk and that it really opened the door to keep us relevant today, you know, as we got, as we did, you know, get back together. So we're just starting <laughs> to get the business together to, um, you know, get some uh, uh, recognition, <laughs> you know, for what we did do. Um, and that's, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, I love that track. I mean, that is definitely, I was going to say to me, the hardest edge funk track that you guys did that at least in the yeah. studio. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. That's it. That's mm -hmm. where, <laughs> that's exactly what it was, man. Yeah. That scratchy yeah. guitar and driving rhythm is, is awesome. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, throughout this record though, I mean, just, you know, you had just solid material throughout and, um, um, you know, even the mellow stuff uh, like Love of My Life uh, was nice. And, you know, not only were the instruments together on this record, but you had really good group vocals, too, uh, yeah. on this one. Was there yeah, anything, we, anything done differently production-wise uh, compared to the first one? Well, on the second album, um, the first album was, was produced by Rick Chertoff, who was uh, um, Arista's producer, you know, Clive bought it in. The second album was produced by Rick Chertoff and Kate Williams. So there was a member of the band who was involved in the production. So mm -hmm. that really, I think we really got closer to what the sound of the band is on, on, that, on that second album. Um, in terms of vocals, our, 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 our lead vocalist, Gene Robinson uh, Jr., he, thank God he's still with the band, you know, as we are now, because it's great that we have our original vocalist and we don't have to <laughs> recreate what he's singing. But he's, he's, a, he's a stickler about harmonies. And, and, and we practice then, we practice like crazy, you know, eight hours a day we were, we were working. So when we, it's the funniest thing. So when we got back together, you know, we'd all had these different experiences, you know, playing some some folks that actually weren't even involved in music but um you know it, you change over time you know you don't rehearse like like a young boy anymore or you don't you know you you you, you rehearse because there's a gig or because there's a reason to do it but back then we rehearsed because like as i mentioned earlier because we just love the music but when breakwater got back together it's a funny thing you know we were kind of like a there was a, 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 a thirty-year disconnect, but we we picked up from where we left off at. So we started rehearsing like all the time again, you know. And we worked on those vocals, and we work hard to uh, to make sure that our vocals are right because we're we're musicians. The only really real singer in the band was the um, was uh, uh, Gene Robinson, who actually was our trumpet player, but he was the best singer. And Jimmy Jones, our drummer, he's a great vocalist as well. But the background vocals, uh, myself, Greg, and um, now with the with the new band, since we got uh, got back together, we have a, a female vocalist that we bought in because, you know, a lot of the high notes that uh, we had in the harmonies, you know, as you get older, you can't hit those notes like you used to. Right. <laughs> um, so we have a female vocalist, Adrienne Aje, and she just added a lot to the band. Also with the new band, we have um, we have six. Breakwater was originally an eight-piece band, but now we have an eleven-piece band. So we have five original members and six new members, and we bought in some young people to really add some fire into the band. And it's just our horn section, as Greg had mentioned, it got a lot of young cats and they're just killing. And on keyboards, Gene Robinson, our lead vocal, his son <laughs> is amazing. Is playing keyboards with the band, so it's like you know, second generation breakwater. That's great. And, uh, yeah, it is great, man. So you know, we're having a ball now. We're having a ball now. We're working on new music. Now, the challenge to working on new music after after twenty nine years, and also after Kay Williams um, is not in the band, and that was really his role in the band. That's this taken us a while to find our feet to find. Our, our footing that we, to where we're comfortable with who we are now to do what we do now. Um, and that, and Breakwater has always been a band. So we are a democracy. 
and and working through that good and bad <laughs> yeah it could be a speed bump you know what i mean but we, we we're coming along so we, we're, we're more than halfway through and 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 we're excited about where we're going now with the with the new music well so glad to have you back and um i can't wait to see the latest you know version of the group when when you guys were playing um you know 29 years before you got back together um, who are some of the uh like big names that you actually went out with and can you share maybe one of your most uh, memorable moments from being on the stage? Uh, well, one of the, at that time, well, we went out with Patti LaBelle um, and we went out with, with Gino Vanelli. That probably was our longest tour with Gino. Um, but it was, a, you know, it was a gas working with Patti because, you know, we, we all know Patti and, I did play on her record, her record, if only you knew on a couple of her albums. So that was that was great. But our, I think probably our, our most memorable that I can think of is that our first gig with Gino Vanelli was at a was in Philadelphia, and it was at a, a, a place called the um, Spectrum, which is like the which was at that time it was the biggest venue in Philadelphia. One of the Sixers, huh? Home of the Sixers when they had Dr. J. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. At the Spectrum. Yeah. So it was the first time we go out, we're playing with um with with with, with Gino Vanelli. We get to the Spectrum many, many, many times, seeing everybody who came through, right? Um, and we go for our sound check and the, Gino Vanelli's brother was his was his sound man. And Gino was very meticulous about his sound. And his sound check, I mean, he, he seemed like he sound checked for two to three hours, you know. So by the time we got to sound check and set up, it was really like an afterthought. And we wound up setting up, they wound up setting us up in front of everything else. So even the lights that were, that were set, were set behind us. <laughs> and we were like kind of squeezed to the front of the stage. And at that time, I guess to say quite frankly, I don't think, they, they weren't very weren't very friendly towards us, you know. So we wound up doing this gig, the first time in Philadelphia at the, at the Spectrum. And, and we're, and we, we're, we're our, our sound wasn't quite right. We couldn't hear. And um, it was like, ah, man, you know. But we, you know, we were, we, we uh, were and are uh, troopers, and so we did what we did. We did our best, and it came through, and and that was that. But I think that that was the one that stuck out to me because it was it, it started off like so uh, so negatively. Then the next get time gig was we played in Pittsburgh, and by that time I got to know a couple of the guys in Gino's band, um, the great guitarist Daryl Strummer and. Um, Oh, was the bass player the guy. He played with Frank Zappa for a while. Um, Tom. What's Tom? Anyway, so I got to know them, and 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 so then the walls were down. It wasn't like so. Then everything from that point went great, and they were very, very welcoming to us, you know. And so the rest of that concert was great. The rest of that tour was great. Yeah. Did, did you ever end up playing any of those sort of like funk fest type things with other funk bands or did you kind of stay away from those? We stayed away from that. Um, not because we, um, we didn't want to. It's just that, and in all honesty, I mean, hey, I'm, that's all I got left is honesty. In all honesty, I, think, I, I don't think our management company knew what to do with us. I don't think they knew how to manage the band. I don't think they knew how to book the band. I think that they were they were unprepared for who we were, and they, in, in, in my opinion, didn't do what they were supposed to do. So we actually didn't work as much as we could have or should have. Well, you know, I heard I've heard on this show a lot of mixed things about Arista at that time, uh, especially with uh, R and B Black Axe, you know, right. from Gil Scott Heron. To, to you guys, um, uh, there were so many that were on that label. Um, 
uh, Ray Parker. Um, yeah. yeah, so many. So in some cases, it seemed to work out well. In other cases, it did not work out that well. Yeah, it it almost felt like like maybe you know there was a, a certain amount of, uh, of of writing off, like you know there was there was there wasn't enthusiasm like it like it should have been, you know. Um, wasn't wasn't I don't know I don't I just felt like maybe it wasn't pushed as much as as it could have been, and there wasn't enough behind it. Um, sure. Yeah, and that combined with our management company at that time, I think really was a, a, a deterrent or a hindrance to what we could have done. Yeah. So, so after that second record, what transpired? When did you guys break up? When did you realize you weren't going to do a third record? Yeah. Well, after after the second second record. Um, I actually was the first one to leave the band um, because at that time I was, I, you know, this happens in bands all the time. I wanted to do, <laughs> I wanted to do my own thing, you know, I wanted to, uh, to uh, you know, play more, uh, do, do my own thing. And I was also touring with Dexter Wanzell and playing on a bunch of records in Philly International. So, I kind of went that way. The band stayed together for uh, maybe another five or six months and then broke up. Um, but I think that if we had more more support and more and, and better management, I think the band would have, would, would, would have survived. But you know things things happen the way they happen because there are no mistakes in life. So I wouldn't change anything that has happened. Um, in, in my life, um, you know, for anything in the world, every experience has been has been a learning experience. It was good. And hey, who would have thunk that after thirty years that the band would have gotten back together? So, it, one never knows, does one? No, they sure don't. <laughs> um, but that's fantastic um, that you guys are back. Yeah. Um, when you look back, do you have any? Um, any regrets at all, or is, um, feel blessed and good about it all? Well, yeah, I definitely feel ble blessed about about it all. Um, yeah, regrets, of course. I have a few, but not too few to mention. It's a song or something. Um, yeah, I have regrets, but you know, who doesn't have regrets in life, right? Um, but it was a, you know, what was was was, and it was a great experience to be young and to you know, have a, a major recording deal as a band and to, and to experience all the things that we experienced and to still be in the game and doing it and healthy enough, you know, praise God that, uh, you know, I'm here talking to you about it right now. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and, we're, and what are we talking about? We're talking about Breakwater now, you know, so it's, it's just great, man, to, 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 uh, to be uh, back in, in the saddle. Um, we work, worked it out. And you know, uh, you know, we're still together, and uh, every folks have grown older, and but we're still we're still we're still together, and still still kicking it. So it's a good thing. No no regrets. No regrets. Steve, do you know how how they came up with that name Breakwater? The name Breakwater. I was told it's not because you know I joined a band after the band had been together for, but I was told that. Somebody went through a dictionary. It was it was it wasn't it wasn't sexy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the way they found it. Someone uh, went through a dictionary and came up with that name as they were looking for names for the band, and someone came up with Breakwater and, and, it, and it kind of stuck. Yeah. If uh, somebody asked you um, to sum up the sound of Breakwater and what made the group special or different, what would you say? I would say musicianship, rhythm and blues, funk, jazz, a uh, little rock, happiness, good vibes, good message, messages of love. We write a lot of songs about love. You know, we want positive, positive songs um, and just a good time. And even now, you know, the thing is, is before we perform, when we go, you know, before we go on stage, 
um, we, you know, we get together and, and our prayer is that we would touch these people who are getting ready to hear us play so that maybe if they were fear, there's something that was bringing them down or they were carrying some heavy load that it would be lightened and the joy would replace whatever negativity that they have. And that's what, that's what we, that's what we aim to do every time that we play. And really the reason that we got back together and we're back together now is because of our fans, really. Because when we see their faces, when we play these songs that, because, you know, most of our fans can relate back to a point in their life when they were listening to our music. You know, this is when they graduated from high school. This is when they were in college. And so it takes them there. And all these years later, they feel that, you know, our, our seasoned fans. Now, our new fans, they're, it's another thing because they're like, wow, this is great. These guys, this is real music, you know. But, you know, to take these people there and to be there, we just want to, uh, you know, let love in and just, you know, make everybody happy and give a positive, positive uh, uh experience into the world through our music and that's really it might sound corny but that is really what we what we aim to do every time that we that we perform and you know what scott when folks come up up come up to us after a gig and say wow you know you guys still sound the same man you took me back man i was right there you know i feel so good or you know i like this woman said to me one time she said you know i i I really wasn't even going to come out because I wasn't feeling that great, you know, but I, but I came and I, I've been dancing all night long. I, I am so happy. I just want to thank you. And that just made me know that, that our prayers were answered because that is what we were aiming to do. And that's what, that's what was done. You know, somebody, somebody was touched, you know, by this talent that God has given us. That's phenomenal, um, Steve. And, and that's what this show is about, too. You know, is a lot of people are going to watch it as they do the other editions. And, you know, they look at musicians like yourself and the music that meant so much in their lives and touched them in a special way. And to be able to connect also with the makers of that music that was so important to them, it's just super meaningful. And so I'm just glad also that I can help bring that and be the conduit to make that happen. Oh, this is a great thing you're doing, man. I, I was, uh, I watched some of the other interviews that you did, man, and I was just like, "This is great, man!" You know, <laughs> you're creating such a great platform for for music to, uh, you know, be to be explained and and for the inside of what's going on or what has happened to, you know, to be uh, um, preserved. That's important stuff you're doing, man. Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm just trying to give back because the music's meant so much in my life. Um, and, and and I thank you for that, uh, Steve. And how can people best keep up with everything that you guys are doing now? What are the uh, channels for that? Well, the best way for to keep up with what Breakwater's doing at this point is on Facebook. Um, Breakwater's Facebook page. Um, let's go and sign up. And Very there. good. Any uh, last message you want to get out to uh, viewers or your fans? Yeah, I do. Um, listen, stay positive, man, because you never know. Never give up. You never know what's around the corner. You know, just keep moving. Keep running this race because, you know, um, the God is real. And, you know, don't give up. Don't give up. And we love you. You know we love you. <laughs> Outstanding. Long live Breakwater. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been a blast. Oh, I've had a great time as well. Thank you, Scott. I have to say, there's nothing better than talented musicians who do what they do purely for the love of it and the fulfillment of touching listeners. I have to believe that this was the most, most in-depth account of Breakwater ever documented. And so I'm very pleased to be able to bring it to fruition for you, the Truth and Rhythm viewer. A hearty thank you again to Mr. Greg Scott and Steve Green, fluid players who continue to keep breakwater flowing. Also, as always, a sincere thank you out to the viewers and listeners. Much appreciate the support and interest. Be sure to look out for upcoming Truth and Rhythm episodes and catch up with previous installments 
at funkysiff.net on YouTube, iTunes, and other podcast providers. Subscribe to Truth and Rhythm. Go to YouTube. Click on um, the Funk and Stuff channel and subscribe. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives. And we have a new feature now, too, called uh, Truth and Rhythm Quick Takes, which are shorter excerpts from these lengthy interviews touching on key moments in band history and musical history. So you don't want to miss those either. Tell a friend, tell family, support these great musicians from R&B, funk, jazz, and soul. Give up the love. And give up the one, because as always, this is Scott Dr. G. Skolfine, parting ways and saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.